So do you check your weekly horoscope regularly to see what the stars have in store for you or maybe you're just occasionally curious and you consult uh, your reading before starting something important or maybe you're on the other side of the fence completely and you consider astrology to be a pseudoscience I mean how can inert balls of rock and fire which are millions and billions of miles away from you have a say in your daily life regardless of what your relationship with astrology is there is no denying that is present everywhere especially online today and it's been around for a long long time centuries in fact and there was a time when astrology and astronomy were actually overlapping sciences and sometimes the one and the same so much so that famous astronomers from those times and scientists like newton and kepler and galileo just to name a few actually held astrology in very high esteem And of course astrology has been a huge presence in many ancient civilizations in many different forms not just in India but Egyptian and Greek and you know Arabian and in India today especially it's widely accepted and practiced very commonly in, in a form known as Vedic astrology and in today's podcast I talk to renowned Vedic astrologer Pandit Freedom Kohl who has an extensive history with India on many levels and and try to understand how vedic astrology works you know what's the principle behind this influence the cosmic bodies have on our lives so this this won't be your typical horoscope reading and weekly forecast or things like that uh it's more looking into the principles and and the, the nuts and bolts behind the whole system if you are interested in learning vedic astrology i highly recommend reading freedom's foundational books on jyotisha or science of light as it's appropriately titled volumes 1 and 2 his astrology is directly based on the brihat parashara hora shastra which is the, an ancient sanskrit work without much ado we jump right into the podcast i hope you really enjoy this video and please 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 remember to subscribe to the channel and like the video share the video and if you have any questions on astrology and i mean questions on how astrology works feel free to write in the comment box thank you so much hello and uh, welcome to the channel uh, i hope you guys are doing well in uh, today's podcast we will be not talking about uh, aliens or ufo's or artificial intelligence or uh, those topics for a change but we will be speaking of um, other mysteries of the cosmos and how the cosmos influences human beings and um, and topics like that so we'll be talking about uh, vedic astrology and i am happy to have with me today pandit freedom tobias kol Freedom thank you so much for joining I hope you're doing well how's the how did the eclipse treat you I good I you know I do lots of preparation and rituals and we lots of students we're all doing things together and so we we work hard we prepare work hard before and during the eclipse to make sure that we get the best out of it So so I I I'm guessing that's that's a resounding that was a resounding success Yes it was and it was a good one personally and i did mention that you were um a, a vedic astrologer in the introduction but of course i left out the fact that you are not just a vedic astrologer you're also a yoga teacher you're also an ayurveda expert you also coach people and you've written books you're an author you're a speaker it almost looks to me like you when you were young you read your own chart and decided this is the life that i'm going to do it in and then you just crammed it all i mean people take lifetimes to do even one of this if if only it was a choice you, you know i i i i grew up doing yoga met my yoga guru he got me into to ayurveda i was like oh my gosh this how can i do yoga without ayurveda so i went to ayurveda school i'm in ayurveda school and and then they had a a medical astrology section and i was like oh my gosh how can i do medicine without knowing medical astrology and then the next thing i know i'm um uh you know a decade goes by traveling india finding the best teachers that are available spending my whole time studying and uh and then you know time just goes but next thing i know because people you 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 learn something people want to 
They're like, hey, what's this say? Hey, I got this disease. Hey, can you help with that? And then next thing I know, I'm I'm charging professionally for, for consultations and life just goes by so quickly. Yeah. Right. So you basically just logically followed wherever it led. I mean, you just picked up the triad and then you went to this and you made an inquiry. And you just So there was no like yeah. a conscious decision to pursue a the, career. The conscious or something decision like was I want to heal people on the deepest level possible. I right. want to be working and, 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 you know, there's, there's uh, spiritual healing, which is on one level, the deepest, but most spiritual healers, they step out of the way and the healing happens. I, I came like, I want to understand what are we made of? What is the human being? What makes us healthy? How are we going? How are we working? Why, why are we unfolding the way we are? And, and just to answer that the universe responded and, and 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 next thing i know i'm i'm deep in the heart of of vedic knowledge right and i just wanted to uh, quickly go into a little bit of your background because of course yeah. you mentioned studying under really illustrious uh, teachers and we know that you study you come from the lineage of sri achyutananda das and your teacher was uh, sri sanjay rath and so on we'll probably get to that but before that could you tell us something about your background before all this like where are you from did you have a normal childhood or were you like, did you have, uh, or did you already know? Like, uh, I like mean, your, uh... you know, my mother was a yoga teacher and, and I okay. should say my mother still is a yoga teacher, um, in, in her mid seventies and, uh, or yeah. And, and she's, she's still teaching yoga classes. She just sent me a picture. She was with, um, one of Iyengar's, Iyengar's top four teachers this past weekend. She said, look, she, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and my, uh, I'm the, the first two like living teachers I had, um, like masters, cause I had you know, the, the average, um, yoga teacher that we would have in the early nineties. Um, right. but, uh, Hari, um, Hari Harananda. Um, Giri, uh, a Kriya Yoga um, from uh, Orissa and right. uh, Odisha now, and um, and Baba Hari Das from the Mount Madonna Center, and so uh, you know from a an early age at, at eighteen, I I had Diksha into proper traditional lineages, and in India, one of the things about a traditional lineage is it's a lifetime of study. It's it's not a it's not something that you learn in a weekend or a month or a year. It's uh, an ongoing process. And so those were my first two teachers, and uh, I feel really lucky to have had teachers who uh, were very authentic and and guided me to source materials and really were able to teach me what is quality, and and what are the texts and and how and and so after them. Um, I went to Ayurveda school and then I, uh, the internship was in India and I was able to travel around and talk to different teachers and, and meet more teachers there. And uh, it took two years before I met Pandit Sanjay Rath um, as my uh, Jyotish guru. Um, and Vagi Shastri was my Sanskrit guru and a few other smaller teachers. But those are my, um, uh, and uh, and then I have my, my spiritual guru. Sometimes people are like, well, but they're, they, you know, the guru is, is my Sanskrit guru. He teaches all kinds of spirituality, but it's primarily Sanskrit. My right. Jyotish guru, he teaches all kinds of things, but the core, everything revolves around is, is Jyotish astrology. And so in this way, each teacher has the, the core that they, they share. Right. And, and you mentioned at the beginning, uh, Sri, um, uh, the, one of the teachers from the, the Kriya Yoga tradition. Uh, he, of course, was, uh, I mean, I read that he was a direct disciple of Sri Yukteswar Giri himself, yes. right? Is that, is that right? Yes. So basically, he was a brother disciple of uh, Paramahamsa Yogananda, who wrote the autobiography of Yogi. He was, he was both a brother disciple of Yogananda, and he also got Diksha from Yogananda, because Yogananda was... Okay. At the at the time, a senior guru brother, um, but Yogananda then was sent to America to take care of Westerners, and eventually right. Hari Harananda became in charge of the same lineage, but for India. 
Right, right. And you were probably quite young when you were interacting with him. And uh, any experiences with Kriya or something like this? Or? <sighs> experiences from that side? Um, so my first initiation in that tradition was one of his his main disciples. And, and at that time, I wasn't doing astrology or anything of that okay. nature. And uh, there was one part where, you know, our thumbs are in our ears and we cover our eyes and, and, and uh, the guru who was initiating, he, he put his hand on my head and he did whatever he was doing. And I, I wasn't in my body. And, and I was oh. in outer space, in, in, in the inner world. I was, I was completely in outer space. And when I say in outer space, I was looking and I was like, ah, this is what Jupiter looks like. It, like, like literally it was this surprising moment of ah. And I was, I, I saw the whole solar system and I was looking at her and, and then pff, I'm back in the body. And, and so it was, it was a, a powerful first interacting with that lineage there. And uh, oh. Hariharananda himself, uh, d d you know, um, the, the subtle energies, they're sometimes hard to put into, you know, one story that fully captures everything. But um, during one initiation with him, he said, bring your awareness here. And, and he touched my elbow. Bring your awareness here. And he touched my wrist. And he just touched it with maybe two or three fingers. It was, and, and the whole region pulsed. It was like the, the, oh. the energy, as if there's the energy center in that realm was just pulsing and alive. And, um, yeah. So, so he, he was kind he of was, activated the different uh, spots in, on your body. Which is what an initiation should be. There should be right. some activation happening. And for that tradition, that's what they focus on. There was that awakening with him. Wow. Okay. And so just coming straight to the topic of Vedic astrology. Yes. Now, obviously, this is not a podcast where we're going to look at readings and look into the details of uh, things like that because there are other videos on the internet. So what I was trying to understand is how does astrology in general work because of course like what is the what is the nature of influence of these cosmic bodies on human beings like how does uh like if you look at it i mean scientifically how does this this you know planet which is so far away from me or this uh, or the sun or the moon or all these celestial bodies of course when you speak of gravitation i mean it's kind of measurable and you know there are mathematical equations i know the influence there is you know, electromagnetic radiation. What is the nature of influence? How do they have influence on us? Yeah. So um, um, we, we have two directions to go there, to, to fully okay. um, under, understand this in a, a, a proper way. From, from what, what does the Vedic tradition teach us? What does it reveal to us? And so we have the physical realm, and then we have the realm that's actually influencing us. And right. if we come, we, we look first just at the physical realm. And unfortunately, people, they overfocus on the physical realm. The gravity from here and how much this body is interacting and pulling us in this direction. And people want to, they want to have a, a physical um, understanding. And uh, from, that, from that physical side, there is a physical interaction, but it's slightly different than the way people see it. People see themselves as existing. And then this being a force that's interacting with them, where it's, it's actually the other way around. If we look at human life evolving on this planet, um, the moon is moving a certain cycle around us, and the day is a certain length. And our rhythms of our bodies, the hormones, the melatonin, the everything, it turns on, it has its cycle, it turns off. And that's in us, that's in, in, in animals, that's in lower life forms, that's in plants. Like we go back to, so life is pulsing with the fact that it's day, night, day, night, that the moon is moving in a certain, you know, a certain, uh, time cycle around the planet. The distance of the earth from the sun and the distance of the moon from the earth, which is an incredible magic ratio, which is a, whole nother discussion but that 
that frequency of revolution evolved from the single cell organism all the way up to, to what we are. And it's embedded within us. It's embedded with how we work. It's embedded with our with the fact that we're born babies and we grow and how long do, is our life cycle. Um, if we look w within a woman, you know, there's the menstrual cycle, which matches the cycle of the moon. And it's not like there was a woman and, and her cycle decided to match the moon. The moon created the cycle of hormonal changes that are existing in her. So we evolved into the gravitational forces that the solar system evokes on this planet. So we are a result of the solar system. Right. The solar system is not, you know, impacting us and we're separate entities living and in, in something that's inter. We are the result of these forces. So, so right. that's from the physical perspective, right? Right. <laughs> Uh, but, but it's an important difference of of um, do we put ourselves first and say how's this? We are born in this, right? We are coming. No, it it kind of makes makes a lot of sense. So it's not it's so we are the result of the product of influences that have gone on for so many ages, and we didn't just spring up and something come from outside. So we sort of all that we are now, we are literally made by the stars in a way. We are made by these cycles. And, and right. so these cycles, that's, that's the next level for us to really get to the subtle realm. Um, because everything is moving in cycles. And we're in, in the Western world these days, we, we use a Gregorian calendar that the Pope made. And we say that today is April 15th. And what does that mean? It doesn't actually mean anything star-wise. In, in a traditional calendar, today is a certain phase of the moon. Right. And and that phase of the moon was, in the traditional world, what the day was. And And we have 30 days in a month because originally each day was connected to one of the phases of the moon. And if if the day was the 15th, um, it would be the full moon if if we were actually on a lunar cycle because it would be 15 up, 15 back, 15 up, 15 um, to new. Uh, so we live in this realm of cycles. And so when we start looking at the uh, realm of Vedic astrology, we have to step into a more fourth dimensional uh, thinking process. We are beings that are living in time. And we're born babies. And some time cycle that's in us makes us at one years old, old start walking. And at two, from two to three, makes us start talking. And around 13, we hit puberty. It's, it's this cycle. It just we, we plant uh, a carrot and, and it'll grow. And at a certain point, it'll be done. There's, there's an inherent uh, time cycle that lives inside of it. Right. So that's from the physical level, but also in our life, in our, our social development, there's also a cycle that's happening. And within the uh, traditional understanding of astrology, and I say traditional, where we're, we're leaving signs and planets and everything of that nature, but time itself is, is qualitative. There are days that have growing energy. There are days that are very musical. And we've all had days that we want to just sing. We've all had days that are just bad days. And, and so t the time has a quality to it. And anything created, just like, um, uh, and uh, the, the most famous thing that people look at the time of creation is wines. People are like, oh, it's this year, and that year it rains so much, and so it means the, the wine tastes a certain way. And another year, there was a drought, and so it made the wine taste a different way. And so people, based upon the year, know what the quality of this wine is. So right. similarly, we are created beings, and there is a quality of time in each moment. And depending on that moment of time that we're born into, it shaped 
what we are, what we are becoming, where we are going. And what is making that quality of time is this big clock of the solar system that we live in. The lunar right. phases, the eclipses, the, the cycles of Jupiter, the, 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 the retrogrades of Mercury, all of this is creating a quality of time. And we get born into that. And so a certain flavor is created, a flavor of right. a human being. And that flavor of a human being is then put into a different culture. So there might be a flavor of a human being and, and they're born in South India. That same flavor of a human being is put into North Africa. That same flavor is put into London. And that flavor is, is maybe if we say it's a flavor of art. So that person in London is going to be attracted to a certain quality of art because of how they're conditioned. Where the person in South India, their style of art is very different. But yet the nature there is that this, this desire to create something beautiful that was stamped at the moment of creation. And so they take the elements of that culture and, and bring it forth. So right. instead of seeing it as a gravitational force impacting us, it's more about this clock of, of qualitative time that we live inside of. And again, if we think that we're this thing that they're influencing, uh, we, we might have a hard time. But if we get that we were cre we were created by this clock. Got it. And so right. this unfolding of time is what our life looks like. Right. Then then I guess the logical question is what about what about free will and karma and things like that? Why are the fates of people so diverse? Like why are there so many different outcomes in people's lives uh, if everything is cyclical and sort of predictive and set in a certain way, you know? But you see, predictive, what is, what is predictive and, and predictive is, is probability. And okay. astrology is, is much more a science of, of probabilities. Um, there is, and, and, and we know with politics, if you uh, do certain things to a certain country, they're going to respond in a certain way. Um, we know with our spouses, if we say certain things, they're going to respond a certain way. And we're, we're not guaranteed how they're going to respond. But there's a probability that if you say, if you do the thing that makes your spouse very upset, they will respond in the angry way that they respond as a person. But it's not always. They could have had some good news that altered. They, they might that day not even care how you what you said. And so right. there's these... And, and so what, how they respond was stamped at the moment they were created. Then whether you say it or not is, uh, there's, there's motions, there's qualities of time. And just, you know, we just had this, this very intense solar eclipse. Uh, about the 10 days before a solar eclipse, people's, um, patience gets very thin. And so, uh, something that might not agitate somebody, might agitate them more. There's there's so many relationship issues that arise where sometimes people like the 10 days before an eclipse, if if I have a couple say it's an emergency where this is it's all falling apart. I sit there and say, don't talk to each other until what you know Thursday, which is the day after the eclipse or whatever. And right. and then we get back together and they're like, oh everything's fine now. <laughs> that was the only advice they needed was stay away from this this time where the, the patience is thin and so right. we have these probabilities that arise and uh, some some things in in some people are more probable than others and so without even right. looking at at the stars if we we have um if we know somebody whose intelligence level is very low their probability of getting a, a, a big CEO job is, is uh, no. you know, it, not to say it's fixed karma that they won't, but it's, it's the probability is extremely low. Right. Where that one friend who was the topper in, in your class and uh, a go-getter, the probability of them becoming a CEO is, is very large.
Right. So probably now, does it mean they're guaranteed? Does it not mean that someone might die and they have to go home and and don't get the up? Totally possible. Right. And so when we look at astrology, we have uh, this this direction of probability that it's not guaranteed to happen, but it's more likely. And if we say that the guy who wasn't that smart is it is it fate or free like is it free will for him to be a CEO? The, on a certain level, the, the free will was lost in the creation of, of their intelligence. They didn't have the intelligence to be a CEO. Right. So it's not like, oh, they're trying to create something and, and some outside force is not letting them. It's not their nature. It's not the probability. Right. Right. And the realm that I work in uh, with the astrology is now that person, they might not be a CEO. Fine. There's something else that they will be extremely successful at. And so my goal is, okay, they're not going to be a successful CEO, but what is the probability? Where's the realm of probability? They're going to be so successful. And if I can see that and help them go that direction, they might make more money than the CEO. Right, right. You you know, some of these big construction companies, these guys are millionaires. So they don't need to be a CEO. It's... So, so probability is is the more the, the bigger word. Got it. So, does this influence affect everything uh, on Earth or everywhere? In the sense, it, obviously, it's not just for human beings. So, is there astrology for uh, for a dog or a cat or for a tree or for inanimate, even conceptual, uh, you know, ideas like astrology for a country, for the U.S., for America, for India? How does how does that a hundred percent hundred percent and and so we go back to that beginning statement which was great to start with like how's this work and why right. time has quality to it and when something is created the the fundamental principle of astrology is when something is created the energy of that time is stamped and and creates what the probabilities of the creation are. And so with that in mind, um, when um, your, your dog is born, your dog also is born in a quality of time. And we all, you know, know, anybody that has pets knows that sometimes they have really sweet dogs and sometimes the dog doesn't have as good of a temperament. And, and whatever the breed is, that we even have this variation happening in. Um, uh, as far as... Um, I was reading a a report on cloning, and uh, and they, it was plant cloning. So very simple, but they were noticing in the genetic studies that even when they made a clone, there was genetic alteration, very extremely minimal, but the de- genetic expression changed in in the clone. Right, and uh, and so in that clone the moment that clone is made is impacting what potentialities of of its nature can come forth in countries um the the moment that the constitution of the country is made it's is a moment of time and so right now and and i don't know how good it is you know the 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 country of india um the chart that was chosen because they chose, they had an astrologer, and he picked the time for them to to sign the constitution, and it was a very prosperous time. But it wasn't as spirit. Like I would have rather have had India had an awesome spiritual chart. Plus or minus, you know, India is on its way to become one of the, uh, 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 the uh, a superpower right now based upon the chart that they chose. They they chose India becoming a superpower, moreover supporting the, the, the spiritual um, expression of India. Uh, if we look at Russia's chart, um, Russia just, uh, it was, um, there, was, there was an eclipse that went right through Russia just before the war. Um, and we can see the impact that had with the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, with uh, the Gaza-Israel war, um, it was it happened just bef- just and remember I said 10 days before the patience gets really thin. Yeah. So you'll see the results of an eclipse come about 10 days. Like they can come anywhere 
10 days even before the eclipse, we'll, we'll start seeing the results. And uh, the whole war started uh, a few days before a lunar eclipse that was directly on one of the most important points in Israel's chart. And, and so we can see um, it impacts countries, it impacts uh, businesses, the moment a business is, is created. One of, and, and you've, you've discussed AI, uh, to me, one of the, uh, to me, what would be a, an amazing study, uh, because AI sometimes goes in directions people don't even know exactly where it's going. Right. And AI sometimes outsmarts the people who are interacting with it. Like AI will lie and, and pretend to not know something. But because, I mean, it's, it's literally, you, however people say it, there's an intelligence happening there. And, and uh, the direction, you know, there's a time where good quality, honest humans are, are created. And there's moments in time where mean, cruel people are born. And so if we're making AI, like we should be turning on these systems on moments where it's a good person. It, it would be the chart of a kind, caring, good quality person. Right. And then we know that that system is probability is going to be going in a healthier direction right. for the human, for, for humans on this planet, right? Right. right. That, that makes so sense. yes, it affects everything. Right. So, so basically the way I understand it, of course, the point that you just made, everything depends on the time yeah. that the, the conditions during which when something is born. At the moment of creation, what are the influences? And that sort of puts a time stamp on it. This makes sense. But then there's the other part, which are ongoing transits, right? Like the, 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 yes. the sky and the stamp when I was born was different, of course, and it made who I am, me, who I am now. But then there are these ongoing transits and eclipses and movements and retrogrades and so on, which, which, which bring me things and take things away and show me things and, you know, give me a lesson in life. So there is the constant influence of the ongoing transit. Now, the question I had was, what about people who remove themselves from this place? What about astronauts? What about people who cease to have a geocentric view of the cosmos let's say they go to mars let's say they go leave the solar system let's say they go to andromeda in the future does astrology still work for them so um just like there's there's uh, newtonian physics and then there's nuclear physics and and quantum physics right there's different physics for different levels that we're looking at right uh, i i you know, if if people end up with living on the moon and having a moon base or living on Mars and having a, you know, a, a base on Mars, I am very, I think there's a great probability that we will have massive genetic alterations happening. Um, ones that, and, and we don't really see, there's, there's all these animals that have evolved and we don't see like new turtles just showing up and evolving. We we don't see the uh, evolution process right. because it's so micro element wise. Um, the the distance of the Earth from the Sun and and the Moon from the Earth it changes over thousands and thousands of years. And so this evolution is this um, slower process. But if we jump our genetic material onto a different uh, astral body. I am pretty sure that the genetic material is going to be reacting to whole different uh, spin cycles, gravitational fields, and and everything, a, a, a new time. Right. And there's actually, um, I saw an article on it, uh, a discussion, uh, there, there, it's actually a competition um, that I was reading about. They're trying to figure out how do we make clocks on the moon? Because literally time is moving they say it moves about a second slower right. on the moon. Right. And and that one second difference is it, it it'll add up over time and and the the synchronizing of of satellites and everything um that is required for for space travel. Right. And and that little difference of one second in time is also involving a huge different sphere of of existence. 
And I'm not sure about the time cycle that things would move differently on Mars, but uh, there will be a different quality of time that will alter. And so um, a new system of astrology will need to be created for that location. Right. So, for example, if uh, I was under the influence of Saturn at the moment, all I have to do is leave the planet and leave the solar system and just to get a temporary respite. Do you think it'll work? Um, uh, th there's, there's, there's mythology of, um, uh, of, of the ancient Vedic rishis that when it, there, there was a bad cycle, they would go up to the North Pole where one, where, where the whole year would be one, where one, it, it, the year would be one day. And so then they'd come back down after the cycle was done. Right. And, um, but it's a funny discussion because they say this in, in the Indian scriptures that they would go to the North Pole to do this, meaning they understood that, a, that the time difference of what happens at the North Pole, right. which is, is, is quite amazing. It, it, it lets you know that they understood um, very clearly that we live on a globe. Right. Right. And so, so the, this brings me to the question, who discovered these hidden principles? Uh, how how yeah. old is astrology? I mean, specifically Vedic astrology but also astrology in general, because there's always this controversy over which is original. Is it Greek and Hellenistic astrology or Indian astrology and so on? There's always this argument. But astrology in general, where did this come from? How did people codify these hidden yeah. uh, interdependencies? And, and so uh, there's, there's a lot of politics that goes into that question. Right. And uh, we are coming out of a realm where and I actually have a student right now translating a 17th century diary, um, 1761, a, a particular Frenchman. He, he was going to South India to observe the um, Venus going over the sun. And, uh, and it talks all, he, he's, he's in all of his discussions. And at that time, the Brits and the French we're like, oh my gosh, look how much astrology, the, look how much astronomy these guys know. Find as much text as you can, because India was ahead astronomically at, in, in, in the 16, 1700s. By the end of the 1700s, Britain and, and the French had digested everything, created instruments, and, and jumped light years ahead. And so when we say who created the astronomy, can we say it was the Brits that created this astro astronomy? You know, they were borrowing and taking from everybody. Right. And so uh, when we go back into the ancient world, it was the same. Same things were happening. Something would be developed in, in, in Egypt. And the Indians who were trade South India was trading with Egypt on a since um, uh, 3000... BC time period, we, we have archaeological evidence. And, and so they'd learn something there, they'd come back and adjust it a different way. And then Mesopotamia would take and, and alter something and develop it for a few hundred years. And, and so we have, um, in the ancient world, a few thousand years of development happening. And the first thing to, to really need to be developed was, was qualities of, of, of time observation. And, you know, they were understanding the lunar cycles, the year cycles, and, and the day cycles. And from the understanding of those three things, uh, they started to mark what happens when it's like, you know, this day, this time of year, um, this lunar cycle. And, and they, they slowly learned th uh, in the stars which ones were planets and which ones were, were fixed stars. Right. And, and they started to, to, to record when this is like this, this is what it's, this is the quality of the day. When this is rising, there's war happening. You know, there's war tensions. When this is happening, there's, there's marriages. And, and so we find um, in the, the Mesopotamians and Babylonians um, making these records and we don't have Egyptian records. We don't have Indian records because the Egyptians wrote on papyrus. It's all gone. Um, the Indians wrote on bamboo leaves. It's all gone. Right. 
Uh, but we we see these we, in some places 800 years of observation, 800 years where they're marking the positions of everything and then understanding what happened at that time. And it slowly evolved from what was happening around to what the quality of the persons were in these times. And uh, we're looking not at something, and there'll be people that say, oh, it was transmitted in X amount of moment. That's not what the archaeological record actually shows us. The archaeological record shows us uh, hundreds of years of, of slow evolution and understanding and different calendar systems being used and, and time periods where um, Indian systems of time were being merged with Babylonian systems of time. And I should say Mesopotamian systems of time, because it was even before Babylonia. It, we, were, we were in the Sumerian, um, uh, the Sumerian and the Indus Valley civilizations with with Egypt. Right. There, there's uh, a lot of research on how they kept time, and you know how many months were there. Why did they make the months in the certain way? And from the months, we slowly um, divided the sky into signs. And those signs were, where's the sun during this month? And so every, the, the time cycle was a record of the solar system around us. And then we had these planets moving inside of that, which became slowly houses and signs with planets in, in a chart. So um, how did it discover? Uh, and if we get mythologically, if we go into the Shastras, at some point, the creator God talked to the one sage and he gave him the whole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and to me, this is this is uh, a bit of a, a, a more of a mythological creation. And uh, when we look at these mythologies, the mythologies always hide some uh, teaching. It's metaphorical. Some, some type of teaching. Say again. Was, is it metaphorical? Metaphorical. There's some metaphor. Like, is it the creator god that is giving a certain teaching, or is it the um, snake god from the underworld that is giving a teaching? Like, a lot of the astronomy was taught from the snake gods from the underworld. Like, th there's there's a, a a meaning of of what kind of energy that we need to work with to understand that knowledge um, that's being communicated in the mythology. So we have the mythology that is giving us a metaphor of the states of consciousness required. But then we have the archaeological record that really shows that um, the best minds of the world, the best minds, you know, the people that are nuclear physicists and AI engineers in our day and age, in, in the ancient world, that same level of intelligence was there. And it was looking at 800 years 800 years of records and they started to develop all kinds of cycles to come they eventually um by around 400 bc knew without even looking at the sky where the planets would be because they had kept track for so long they understood the cycles that they could just write in the book this is where the planets are going to be right right and uh so so it was it was a extended time period of codification and once we understand the time then we start understanding where things are in that time then comes the paying attention so this is happening what does it feel like what's my experience at that time what happens to people that um were born in that moment and we have another few hundred slash few thousand years of of discovery and that discovery is not done. Uh, it's not like astrology just like stopped at a certain moment. Right. We're right. The, the group of, of students that I have, we are constantly doing research. And um, just as an example, uh, uh, cryptocurrency. You know, what, what planet rules cryptocurrency? There's no, you're not going to find that in any of these ancient texts, right? right. So what did we do? We we took a few people who were cryptocurrency millionaires, who who made their millions through cryptocurrency, and then we got the charts of a few of the CEOs of big cryptocurrency companies, and we just looked and we said, what do the the people that made the companies? What are the combinations that are indicating their career? 
the people that became rich, what are the combinations that are are creating that they sh that show they have all this money coming from this element? And we were able to see that the North Node, Rahu, and Mercury uh, having some influence with Venus. And I don't fully understand the Venus connection, but it was clear in, in all the charts that um, uh, this these these were the planets that were bringing this forth. Right. So the uh, the the research through observation is it, it didn't ever stop. It's literally still continuing. And when I first met my 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 guru, um, I, Mercury and and South Node conjunctions. He uh, in in a particular place in in the divisional charts. Um, he said that's what makes a. a um, a software engineer. And I'm like, software engineer, how, 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 how are you saying this? Right? Like, you know, how can he say that this combination is a software where, what? And, and I live in California and in uh, the two thousands, I lived in the Bay area, saw tons of Silicon Valley um, uh, guys working in that realm. 110%. It, it was the combination. And, and I could see even sometimes uh, where a person, they were being a software engineer. And they didn't have the combination. And I, I would say, so who told you to be a software engineer? Right. And it was always, well, my dad thought it would be a good opportunity. Well, it was like obvious that they were pushing themselves in a direction that wasn't them. And so we, we would talk, what is them? What is them that could, because when you are you at the highest capacity, you'll be more, you'll make more money being you at, at something random. Like, I, I mean, uh, you know, my, my family expected me to be a big doctor. I was, you know, I, I was, I, I had, you know, in, in, in grade school, it was, everything was hundreds. And it, it, I finished my, 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 my um, bachelor's in two and a half years. Um, I just took all the, everybody, ex and, and inst I just, I became disillusioned with the Western system. And so after my bachelor's, I was like, I don't want to study with these guys to get my master's. Like, I don't want to. And yeah. at that point in time, I was having interaction with Ayurvedic doctors. And I said, these guys have clear eyes. They, there's a sparkle to their eyes. They smile. There's, there's health about them. They, they have youth. And, and I was looking at some of these professors who were on Prozac and depressed and just, I, I was like, uh, I'm going to India. Right. And 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 so, um, so, you did become a doctor, just not in the traditional sense, the Western sense. Exactly, and and I and, and who would have thought going doing karmic medicine, you know, which is uh, daivya chikitsa, is the treatment using the astrological system. Um, who would think that I could, you know, be successful in California um, by doing that? But I followed what was my thing. And, and that allowed that success to be there. Right. And the big thing is, is sometimes people say, oh, just follow your dream. The chart doesn't know. Just because you're dreaming and it doesn't mean it's what you're good at. So, so just to differentiate, right. I'm not telling anybody, go follow your dream. We want to, what's your talent? What's, what's that special thing about you? And, and how do we mix that with your love to, to create a financial well-being? Right. Right. Yeah. And and so so why is there differences between different codification systems? For example, if you take even Vedic astrology, I know that you the books that you wrote uh, follow the the Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra, but then when I look at the Vedic astrology as such, there's there are so many diverse sources. There's the work of Varahi Mihira. There's Kalyana Varman. There is uh, uh, the Bhrigu Samhita and so many other systems. Are they actually different or are they overlaps or are they essentially the same? So, so all the ones that you said, they all, they overlap. Okay. And the Varaha Mahira tradition uh, overlaps with the Parashara tradition. The Varaha Mahira tradition, um, uh, Brahat Samhita, um, the, these group of texts, and, and there's a, a whole group that come from there. It, uh, it's, it's a much more um, uh, Maga Brahmana. Um, tradition meaning uh, uh, it, it's coming in from Iran, right? Uh, what what is modern day Iran? So it's it's more of this Babylonian Persian um, influenced. Uh, a st um, no, the Varaha Mahira. Okay. Um, the Parashara 
I see as a little bit more indigenous North Indian. And they overlap. Um, the the Varha Mahira overlap, like, like Parashara has 100% of what Varha Mahira has. But Parashara has a lot more and different directions than Varha Mahira has. It's a superset now, of uh, Varaha Mahira. So Parashara... Uh, so the Brihat Samhita is... Varaha Mahira is maybe 60% of Parashara. Okay. And and Parashara has another 40% more forward than, than Varaha Mahira. Right. Now, then we go to the Arabic um, astro And we call it Arab, Arabic now. Um, per, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more Persian-Iranian realm um, that entered the Arab world. But as I said, um, it, it really even even saying whose is it, it is, um, what is is astro astronomy? The Brits, you know, they they got stuff from India, and um, what did the Indians get from the Egyptians and and the Babylonian? Like it's it becomes very difficult to really source, and most likely somebody invented something here, it got over there, it got modified in, in between these different cultures. Um, but if we go to the more what is called Arabic astrology, um, we start getting uh, maybe uh, to to um, to Varamahira about <clears throat> a good percent of Varahamahira maps over, um, not. All that extra forty percent of Parashara maps over okay. into the Arabic, because okay. once we get into the Arabic, we start getting maybe another forty percent on top of Varah Mahira that's not in Varah Mahira. Okay, and then if we move over into the Hellenistic, Hellenistic in the Arabic, and and somebody listening might disagree because it's not my specialty, but I'd say they're about eighty percent similar. Okay, the Hellenistic in the Arabic. Um, they're they're very much overlapping, and the Hebrew astrology similarly was was in there. We don't really know a hundred percent what Egyptian was, but most likely Hellenistic, what we call Hellenistic astrology, was from Egypt, and it. it might have been developed and taught. And we have with us the text from the more Greek. And, and, you know, it was when we say Hellenistic, a lot of people translate that into Greek. And you even said, did it come from the Greeks? The Hellenistic world included North Africa. It included Turkey. And, and so some of these traditional texts that sometimes they, they use the term Greek, but it's actually Hellenistic, meaning this, this whole region that the, the Greeks occupied during that time period. But does the effectiveness of the the system ah, vary? going in that direction? Does, does the effectiveness? And so, um, when when and, and then we have what's the modern evolution, and the modern evolution of astrology is very different than the Hellenistic world. Some people think they're the same, but uh, so uh, the I always make the joke: um, uh, what's what's better, Tai Chi or yoga? <laughs> And, and we can't really, you know, uh, they're different systems. They're both working with prana, subtle energies. Right. They're using slightly different positions. They might be using different mind states to control it. The core that they're working with is the same, but they've developed very different ways of approaching it, moving energy, working with energy. So similarly, the core of, of what's happening in the solar system is we're all observing the same thing. And, and so that stays the same among all of them. The sun is where the sun is. The moon is where the moon is. The angle of relationship between them is no one's disagreeing with that because it's, it's hard. We literally these days use NASA data. Right. You, so, so it's, it's hard science where everything is. Right. Then how do we start interpreting it? Uh, diff things will um, evolve differently in different cultures. If we look, um, Marco Polo brought noodles from China back to Italy. And 
if we look at what happened, it's spaghetti now. And and no one would call spaghetti and chow mein the same, right? Right. right. Um, except maybe a, a, a cheap Indian restaurant, but <laughs> <laughs> um uh in india right you know right. not in, in in the west but um uh, and, and i did i did 16 half years in india so that's why you get all yeah. my indian comments here right. but um uh but but the there, there's an essence of noodle that's the same we can call both a noodle but the chow mein noodle and the italian spaghetti they've evolved differently in their culture do they make them the same? They make them probably similarly. I actually don't know how they make them, but right. we can imagine, you know, how they're working with creating them. Um, do they taste different? One is flat. One is circular. Do they taste different? I'm sure a connoisseur would tell me how they taste different, but texturally they're different. But we're getting basically the same element. Different spices go on top. And so if we look at the astrological systems, these systems, they changed cultures. One culture was more concerned about when am I going to die? Another culture was more concerned about who am I going to marry and who am I going to marry next? <laughs> and, and where the other culture, they're, they're, they're with that partner till death. So they're not concerned in that way. And so the different concerns of the culture are bringing up different observations. Right. They start looking, okay, people are acting this way. What is make, What is the difference between, you saw, like I talked about the cryptocurrency. We just got the charts and we, we explored what is creating this. And you get cultures for hundreds of years observing certain elements and they're going to evolve slightly different. Right. Um, there's different, re like in the West, why somebody gets married out of love versus an arranged marriage in, in Asia is, you know, there's different things that are bringing people to get married. Right. So yeah, go ahead. But, but I guess, I mean, the question I wanted to ask was, doesn't, isn't the yeah. calendar you use, the system of time, how you measure time that you use very crucial because like you mentioned earlier, um, the, the solar or the lunisolar calendars, which are more aligned to the natural cycles versus the Gregorian calendar. So astrology that is based on the cyclical calendar would tend to be more accurate, I guess, than the Gregorian calendar. Or do you think it doesn't make a difference? Like in modern Western astrology versus... Again, go, going back into... Um... Is Tai Chi or yoga better? It's 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 kind of uh, it's different. Okay, it's it's go going about something in a different way. If we look at the um, and it's less about the Gregorian calendar because the Gregorian calendar there's no astrological there's no astrology in it. it it's which which in on my website I I promote a Vedic calendar that's free for anybody that VedicPlanner.com anybody wants to download a Vedic planner um, completely free I I really work on promoting people to use a calendar that actually tells them where the moon is and where the sun is and everything of that nature um, the Gregorian uh, it's it's more what they they call it the tropical versus the sidereal the star based calendar and um, and the star based uh, system that is used in India. And there are some Western systems that use a sidereal um, calculation. Uh, that is telling us where the planets are relative to the stars. The tropical system, which they, they don't say constellations, they say signs. Right. Um, they tell us where the planets are relative to the seasons. Okay. And so one is is a what is the season that the sky is what is happening in the sky relative to the season the other is telling me what is happening with the earth's relationship to the stars and so one and so there's there's this and if we observe both are having an impact on us so if we observe them we will eventually see okay this is this is what happens with when people are doing this element or and and so the systems uh, if if you like um in the tropical which is more the western system uh, and, and i don't like to call it western because there are some westerners who use the sidereal system and there are some uh indians who use the tropical system so it's it's slight misnomer if we 
it, there, it's a majority, but not a, a, a totality. Right. Um, but if we use the more seasonal zodiac, which is common in the West, the better terminology there, right? Right. Um, right. There, there is. Um, we've seen that there are techniques. There are certain techniques in the traditional text that they don't use anymore. And they, and then there's certain techniques that in in the Vedic texts that we we use ten percent of the time that we see them using ninety percent of the time, and they're using it ninety percent of the time because, um, and just as an example, the, the the Western system uses a lot the angle between planets. Is it a ninety degree angle? Is it a um, you know what what is this angle that is happening between them? And they put huge emphasis on that because even whether the seasons or the stars change or not, that doesn't change. And so they put huge emphasis on that where it's it's a secondary, I wouldn't call it secondary, we use it, but we don't put the same level of emphasis on it. Right. And so emphasis will change as these systems evolve slightly differently. Got it. Now, is one better than the, the other? It's It's going to be relative to what you want to see. And it's going to be relative to the person who's reading because, um, you know, is a uh, piano better? Uh, I'm, I'm trying. Is a guitar better than a sitar? I mean, somebody, uh, a sitar is so much more complex. Right. But if you have a terrible sitar player um, uh, next to a guitar that's much simpler, but an incredible guitarist, that incredible guitarist is going to do way more than a, a not good sitarist. But an incredible sitarist, my goodness, what can be done, right? The the the, the realms of music that can come forth from that. A, a guitar can't touch. But so the the person who's who's reading the information will have a huge impact. And we'll see what AI does to that in in the coming years as well. So right, <laughs> yeah. So one quick technical question before we start winding down and close, get closing comments is, yeah. Um, usually, when I look at the, the internet, when you see these readings and horoscopes, and there's always this question that keeps coming up: Should I look at, uh, well, when you look at predictive part of astrology, should I look at the ascendant or the the moon sign? Is the lagna or the rashi or like what's or the sun sign or like what does it matter or what's more important what's more important depends on what we're interested in 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 knowing okay and just as an example in the uh euro euro american cultures uh, the ascendant generally takes prominence if we look at all the traditional Indian texts, the moon takes predominance. And so <clears throat> you're going to say, well, which is right? Again, you know, this difference of evolution in a different culture, um, the ascendant is me. And it's me and my decisions. And in the Euro-American cultures, <clears throat> it, it's, it's a very self-centered um, I'm in charge. I'm going to marry who I want. I'm going to do what I want for a living. I'm going to um, kind of focus where in the traditional Indian um, context and, and also, you know, a lot of Latin countries and, and various other places, um, uh, you know, what you did for a living, um, it, it was a family decision. You know, there was one brother, okay, we're going to have you be the doctor, you be the engineer, you're going to do this. That way they, they had they had family in all realms and or other decisions that the, the family made. And when it came time to get married, mom and dad would meet the spouse, have a discussion, meet their parents. It was two families meeting each other. It wasn't two people, two people's individual desires. It was a, it was two families. And those two families were concerned about the community they lived in. So if we're talking about this uh, community, family-centered uh, question and and directive, 100% the moon. The moon becomes our primary focus. If right. we're talking about an American in California, the moon is is becomes so secondary 
they they might they, they might be completely disconnected from their moon. The ascendant is they're they're completely um uh, uh you know dis, uh, blinded by their ascendant itself. But what about the sun sign then? The sun sign is is it uh, has a similar to ascendant or the, the, the sun sign in 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 western astrology they've put a lot of emphasis on the sun sign right. and it's kind of become popular but that's only maybe the last 200 years or so if we look in the hellenistic system the arabic systems no one was doing an overemphasis on the sun sign um that evolved in the modern sphere because uh if you're going to do monthly forecasts then the if you're going to do a monthly forecast for the general population, you can you can do it with the sun sign. Right. If you, uh, I have clients, you know, some of the um, uh, more big business ones, uh, we might do some rarely every month, but we will sit down and and t graph you know, graph out a few months or, or the year ahead. Okay, let's do this at this time, that at that time. And and I'm specifying on both their their ascendant sign, their moon sign, their sun sign, and every other planet happening in their chart, as well as integrating the transits. Right. So when we get to the quality astrology, um, all factors are being utilized. Right. For for general public enjoyment then we we use a sun sign wow so it's, it's really fascinating and there are you know as you keep explaining these concepts there are so many different uh, questions that keep coming in my mind of course you don't have time for all that so <laughs> maybe uh, sometime in the future like, write them all down write them all down and we'll 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 go go for it again okay okay so just as a as a, as a closing comment um yeah. how has your journey been because when i when you, I, I was reading your uh, uh, book, uh, The Science of Light, which I'll put a link down in the description when this video goes up. Uh, so you show how Vedic astrology is just one anga or limb in a large matrix of system that includes the Vedas, the Upanishads, the other, the grammar and so many other things. So for you, as I was going to say, as an, as an outsider in a way, because you're not Indian, how easy or difficult or how has the journey been where you don't have to you, you don't have you can't learn just vedic astrology because everything is linked to everything else the mythology and yeah. you know the religion and learning sanskrit so how easy or difficult was this journey and how has it been so far how long has it been so many directions we can can go with that okay, one. we'll keep the easy one <laughs> so one of the one of the beautiful things about the Vedas, which are very different than a lot of other religious texts, um, the Vedas themselves are a collection of different rishis. There's a collection of ideas there. And they're not saying, like, th there's multiple creation stories multiple ways that creation came about and they're not saying this is the way and only way there's a term called darshana which means a perspective and they actually tell you to learn multiple perspectives and learn this perspective the logical perspective learn the mythological perspective learn and, and so they're giving us all these different directions because it's actually teaching us to think and to use our rationality and to have this balance between rationality um, with our, our, our faith. And there's even realms in the Veda where they say you don't even need faith. Use your logic, but use your logic in, in a way that is balanced. And they show that balanced way. If, if faith is your path, how do we have a faith that you don't end up with some weird cult? Um, you know, what are the realms of, of observation that we need to have proper faith? And so the Vedas have, they're teaching you how to think. They're not giving us, this is the way, this is the one way, this is the only way. And in that, you can step in from whatever belief system, learn Vedic culture, learn the Vedic teachings, and you're not converting to 
to be a Vedic, a Vedika. Right. You you can you can actually learn Vedas, and it enhances whatever belief system you're coming from. And so, um, my journey uh, after traveling for a while, I had really uh, I just had the luck of of really good teachers, and the astrological tradition is uh, of Sri Achyutananda Das um, is an extremely um, forward and uh, a forward thinking I'm not, it's pluralistic progressive and accepting of of human system um there is um there's a uh, um a, a transvestite nun you know who who ran one of the ashrams there was how you know ways to work with um uh hindu muslim interaction and when we say hindu um, he, these days, there's so much put into Hinduism, but it, there was Shaivite, Vaishnavite, Shakta integration, Sarya integration. Okay, there's this religion, that religion. Where do they overlap? Where are they different? Let's understand them. And and not, um, n there's a Nisanga Buddhi, like not being attached, but really working to understand. And so I, I, felt, I feel so lucky to have landed in a tradition that really looks at the light in all humans and sees so many paths for all of them. And to really read a chart in a way where we really can see people, we have to be in that place where we don't come from a place that this is the best way, but we come from more, what's the way that this person that's going to support who this human is in, in the highest way for their unfoldment. Um, and so in my journey, um, the tradition that I fell into has, has really, uh, and I fell into, you know, I found it and, and, and the, the light bulb said, this, this is where this, this is the view that I want to take on. This is the view that I, uh, this resonates with me. And so I've stayed with it. I've grown in it. It's supported me. I've supported uh, it as best I can, as, as in, with my own devotion to promoting the tradition and teaching um, the, the views and, and making sure that the students I teach um, are, are, are holding the, the widest view and, and acceptance of the human being as possible. Um, my own personal unfoldment. Um, the relationship with the universe, with the conscious universe, not a material universe that is dead, but a, a, a conscious universe that is uh, fully alive and, and, made of wisdom, made of intelligence, to have a relationship, a conscious relationship with that has been a uh, continual flowering that um, this journey has, has blessed me with. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So, Pandit, uh, call on that note, I think we'll have to wrap up today's uh, call. Thank you so much for uh, explaining uh, all these difficult concepts and uh, and uh, it was a very I'm, I'm sure that people who watch it will gain a lot from this video uh thank you so much and uh, namaste and have a i guess you have a great uh, good night uh, yeah <laughs> yes. um and until until we speak next time be well thank you thank you